Good morning, everyone. I'd like to greet you in the precious name of our Lord and our Saviour, Jesus Christ. It certainly is wonderful that we're able to gather again uh, on a day such as today. Uh, I'm mindful of the fact that uh, this is a day that the Lord has made, and I'm thankful that we can rejoice and we can be glad in it. So I'd like to thank you for joining with us today, and I do trust that the Lord will bless you and your families as we have this time uh, together. We're going to sing a song together. Uh, the song is called The Longer I Serve Him. Uh, so some of you may have the words, but I'd encourage you just to enjoy our time together of worship and learning uh, from the Lord. So we'll sing together The Longer I Serve Him. He grows. Well, let's just uh, pause for a word of prayer and commit this time uh, to our Lord. Let's pray. We're thankful, Father, that once again on this, thy day, on the Lord's day, uh, even in a strange uh, manner today, we're able to gather together. And though some of us are with families and some may uh, be isolated, uh, Father, I pray that we might recognize that we're joining together even as one. May we be remembering the promise that where two or three are gathered together in your name, there you'll be in the midst. We pray, Lord, that uh, this day that you would uh, minister to us graciously, as you always do. We pray, Lord, that the word of God may uh, be a, a blessing and an encouragement to us. We uh, would ask, Lord, that whatever we stand in need of today, that we would find that need being met in yourself. So we'll thank you and we'll praise you in the precious name of Jesus, our Saviour. Amen. Well, it's uh, a few th things I'd just like to just mention just before we go to the Word of God. We're going to be in uh, the book of First Chronicles, uh, chapter 6, and then we'll be looking at a few isolated verses as well uh, elsewhere in the Bible. But I'd just like to uh, encourage the, the children, uh, particularly, that after this um, service, around about uh, at um, 12 o'clock, there will be a a video uh, uploaded for the Sunday School and this week we have uh, Kate who will be uh, speaking to the young ones so that will be on our church uh, YouTube account and I'll also link it to uh, the Facebook account so that you can have a look at that as well. It seems like we're going to be meeting like this for a, a few more weeks and uh, we just need to uh, take heart, we need to be encouraged. Uh, I want to uh, just to encourage you this morning, just keep on looking to the Lord and just keep on trusting in Him. 
Uh, remember to spend uh, time with him. You have more opportunity now than ever. Spend time with him in prayer. Spend time uh, with him uh, in his word. And uh, may you use this time uh, that it will benefit you uh, greatly in your own personal walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we've been praying for you. There have been uh, some who have been unwell uh, in the church uh, family. We do want to pray for the Valanti uh, family, for uh, Jerry and Marciala. And we're thankful for the work that they do with the NHS, but they've come down uh, with symptoms. So we've been praying that the Lord would undertake for them and their health. Also, I heard that Oprah had been uh, showing some symptoms. So do uh, remember those that are unwell. Pray for those that may be by themselves. Uh, pray that the Lord would just encourage them and help them. And as you have opportunity, I uh, would encourage you to reach out to them. Well, I'd like you to take your Bibles to the first book of Chronicles. We're in chapter 6. Now, as you know, this, this year for our Bible reading, I've put out a few different plans of how to, uh, uh, different ways in which you're able to read the Bible through uh, in, in the one year. And uh, I've, uh, one of the ways which I'm doing, and this is the first time I'm actually doing it, is to read the Bible through uh, chronologically. So to read the passages as they would have occurred, or as close to as possible, uh, as they would have occurred in real life. And so that's been, uh, I found it to be interesting. It's the first time I've done it. Normally I read the Bible through um, as you find it, uh, in, as you come across the various books. But this year I'm doing it chronologically. And uh, we, uh, if you're nearly up to date with the reading, you will find that you're in the book of First Chronicles. And one of the, the things you'll have noticed is that there's been a toing and froing from uh, First Chronicles uh, to the book of Psalms. Um, and some of the Psalms have kind of linked up, um, but then there have been some Psalms that you think, well, it doesn't really link up with what we've been reading, because First Chronicles, the first part, has quite a few genealogies. And uh, so I found myself thinking that I've I really enjoyed having the break of reading genealogies, because I still read it, um, but you never really get much from it unless you're studying a family or a pattern. Um, so you don't often read a genealogy and, and you say, wow, that was a blessing for me today. You, you know, you, you, it's kind of difficult and hard going sometimes. So having going back and forth in the Psalms has been... Uh, a blessing and a help as you read through some uh, difficult chapters in Chronicles. And I found the, the book of Psalms to be a, a great source of blessing uh, to me. But in reading through the, chroni in, 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 uh, the Chronicles and reading through some of the genealogies uh, this week, I received a blessing. I, I noticed something that I, I haven't uh, quite noticed before. And, and this is going to be the tenor of the reading. Now, I'm not going to read all of the passage because I want you to stay with me. I don't want you to zone out. And the, the genealogies can be tough. So look at verse 18 and verse 19. 1 Chronicles chapter 6, verse 18 and 19. So it says, And the sons of Kohath were Amram and Izar and Hebron and Uzeel, the sons of Merari, Mali and Mushi, these are the families of the Levites according to their fathers. I will stop reading there. I won't read any further because I don't want you to be overwhelmed with blessings and think, well, I just can't take uh, much more of all of those blessings in those genealogies. But um, if you read a section like this, for instance, you, unless you've just given birth to twins and you're looking for names for your twins and you come across names like Mushi and uh, Mali, and you might think, oh, well, that's a, maybe a consideration. And if you have triplets, I don't know if anyone has triplets, but in the very next chapter, in chapter 7, uh, in verse 12, we come across uh, three other names, Shepham, Hapham, and Husham. So if you're looking for names for triplets, um, those are some considerations for you. But so when you're reading these names, you're not going to get a great deal from it. Well, this chapter goes on, and it, you carry on, carry on reading, and you come across a great deal uh, of other names as well. But then you come to verse 31. I'd like you to just uh, cast your eye there. Go, look at verse 31 down to verse 33. And so we have the list of names recorded for us. Then in verse 31, it says, 
And these are they whom David set over the service of song in the house of the Lord, after that the ark had rest. And they ministered before the dwelling place of the tabernacle of the congregation was singing, until Solomon had built the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. And then, now I'd like you to notice this phrase, and then they waited on their office according to their order. And these are they that waited with their children of the sons of the Kohath, Heman, a singer, the son of Joel, the son of Shemuel. Now, when you read these verses, it kind of gives you a little bit of a sense to the other names that you've just read. The names that you read in the Bible aren't there for no rhyme or reason. There's a, a particular reason for it. And so we read that we have in this chapter, there's a, a, the, the descendants of Levi had grown and they were the tribe that had the privilege of serving the Lord. They had to do with the matters of faith uh, concerning the congregation, whether it, if they came from the family of Amram, and uh, not Amram, uh, Aaron, and they were there in the priesthood, or whether they would serve as porters, whether they would serve as singers. Uh, there was this great list compiled, and it gave to people an opportunity, it kind of, if you like, it gave people an equal opportunity to be able to serve the Lord. So this tribe and, and these people, this list of names, they had this great privilege and great responsibility of leading the nation in worship, in the sacrifices, in the priestly duties, in the carrying and the preparing of the various parts of the tabernacle, and also the singing. David gave a, a quite a bit of attention to the singing. And so you can well imagine the, the Levitical priesthood, the tribe grew so large that over time their uh, opportunity to serve became sought after. And so David in his wisdom, and I believe it's by the leading of God, he, he set an order, he, he arranged a group of people. He he set up a, a roster, if you like, if we just bring it into our modern vernacular. He arranged the duties of worship and service and the people that would be involved in it. And some would be musicians, some would serve uh, in, the, in the tabernacle, and they would, have an, they would have a term. And later on, as you continue reading through the Bible, you'll read as to how Joash he did a similar thing where he set an order. Hezekiah uh, set an order. There, was a, there were people that were arranged to be ready to serve. And that's why, just incidentally, when you get to the New Testament and you read about the, the birth of Jesus, and, and leading up to the birth of Jesus, of course, was the birth of John the Baptist. And we read of John the Baptist's father, Zechariah, how that he ministered in the temple, and, and you read there that it says that he, um, he ministered because he was the order of Abbey. So he was part of a group of people that were going to be serving in the temple. And then it goes on to say, and it became his turn, um, just paraphrasing, to go into the temple to burn incense. So what I'm saying is these people had a, there was a list, there was an order to them being able to serve. So this list of names that we read, to take you back to 1 Chronicles chapter 6, this list of names means nothing to you. But just imagine, if you live way back then, just think perhaps you're of the tribe of Levi. Maybe you're the family of Aaron. And there in that list is your name. You read down through the list and you come across Jeremy. You come across Daniel. And you come across Peter. You come across Mark and whatever your name is. And you look at that list. And, and as you look at the list, you say, my name's on the list. And it's getting ready. It's getting time for me to serve. You look at the list. And you say, it's almost my turn to serve. Don't you think that that list would be somewhat more 
of an interesting read if you were that name or perhaps a fam family member was on that on that list and it was nearly your turn to serve i think you'd be getting ready particularly as you saw your the people further down the list getting on you'd be thinking it's nearly my turn it's nearly my turn i'm, I'm going to get ready to to serve the lord but i want to encourage you today to get ready to serve the lord we need to remember that the Bible says that we are a kingdom of priests, each and every one of us. If we know Christ as our saviour, it's our privilege, it's our duty, our responsibility, but our, our privilege to be able to serve the Lord. And you know, when you read the Bible and you come across great many titles in the word of God, uh, you can think of someone who's a disciple, it's a great title to have, or an apostle, or a deacon, or a pastor all, all great titles but one of, the, one of the titles i think people just love to be heard or to be called by is the title of a servant and we remember our lord you know when our, our lord and our savior jesus christ came into this world the bible says that he came not to be ministered unto but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many when he washed his disciples feet he he was setting a pattern as to how we would be able to uh, minister and serve the Lord. And I think it's, it's a tremendous thing to be able to be called a servant of the Lord. When you read in, in the book of Romans, for instance, in the title, in the opening verse, uh, Paul says this. Uh, he says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. That's what he calls himself first. A servant. And then he says, called to be an apostle, separated and to the gospel of God. And so you'll see that title in the word of God as you read it, where a person is a servant of God, a servant of Christ. Sometimes actually you'll find the title being used where it says that he was a servant or she was a servant of the church. So the privilege, ours, dear believer, the privilege is ours to serve. Just imagine if there was this list and your name is on it. You'd be getting so excited because it's nearly your turn to serve. We've been called to serve. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5, the Bible says, Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Verse 9 says, Ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. You go to the, the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, and in chapter 1, verse 5, the Bible says, that, uh, says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth, and to him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. But then the next verse says, in verse 6, And hath made us kings and priests unto God the Father. To him be glory forever. Uh, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Do you see that? He has made us kings and priests. In the Old Testament, they had a priesthood. In the New Testament, we are that priesthood. And we have the privilege of being able to serve our Lord. And I'm sure that uh, many of you, uh, I'm sure all of us, we can't wait until we can gather together at church again. Where we can see one another and be able to speak to one another face to face where we're able to serve the Lord one with another. And as you look forward to that day, I hope it's not too far off, but as you look forward to that day, come ready to serve. Come ready to, to work and to do something for God. Whether you're older or whether you're younger, it makes no difference. God wants all of us to be serving Him. Sometimes the younger Christian thinks like this, well, I'm too young to be able to do much for God. I don't have the experience. And the older person says, well, I'm too old to serve the Lord. 
My time for service is gone. Let's never think like that. As long as we have breath in our bodies, we need to seek to serve the Lord. I like what we read about with Moses in the Old Testament. He lived to the ripe old age of 120 years old. And it is said that you can divide the life of Moses into three different parts. Uh, in, into three series of 40, if you like. In the first 40 years of Moses' life, he learnt how to be somebody. Because he grew up the child of, to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And so the first 40 years, he was learning to be somebody. The second 40 years, why he had killed the Egyptian, he was on his uh, run for his life. So he was living on the other side of the desert. And he stayed there for 40 years. For 40 years, he was learning to be nobody. He was just a shepherd. And then the final 40 years of his life, with God called him back to Egypt to deliver the people of Israel, he learned what God could use and how God could use somebody to learn these two lessons, how to be somebody, how to be nobody, and then just to give your life and give your all to serve your God. Get ready to serve. It's nearly your turn. And I want to say to you, you know, if you feel at this time, maybe your Bible knowledge, some of your um, knowledge of the things of the Word of God, they need to be brushed up on. You have no better time than now to, to brush up your knowledge and understanding of certain things. Sometimes the things that we learn as younger Christians, maybe you've, you've, uh, they're not as sharp to you as they once were. Well, I want to encourage you, just take the time to go back to some of those basics and just encourage yourself in them. Uh, many of you have been through the discipleship course that we do at church uh, with the book uh, Growing in Grace, Growth in Grace. Uh, take the time to, to look over it. Go over those lessons and, and just ready yourself, prepare yourself uh, so that you can serve. And perhaps if you'd like a, um, a copy of that, you can just send me an email or a text um, if you haven't received one. And I'd be so happy to just to, to send you a, a, a digital copy, a PDF or, or some format whereby you can take it and be able to read it and study together. But I want to encourage you to, uh, to get ready to serve the Lord because there's always something. Uh, that you can do. In the book of Titus, chapter 3, uh, Paul said this. He said, put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates. And then he said this, to be ready to every good work. Be ready to every good work. Let me just show you a few thoughts. Uh, I'll share with you a few thoughts as to how to best serve the Lord. And this isn't an exhaustive list. Maybe you have some other thoughts that you'd like to just jot down. But I want to just share you a few things about how to best serve God. So I have six things. I will go through them quickly. So the first thing is quite simply this, is to serve God. Serve God. Now you might say, well, well, of course. That kind of goes without saying. But you know, sometimes all that is called Christian service isn't really Christian service at all. We, we, we can so easily get to the place where instead of serving the Lord, instead of serving God, we're serving our own selfish interests. And so we need to check that what we're doing, we're doing for the glory of God. And only you know your heart. And, and of course, God knows your heart. And so you want to make sure that what you're doing, you're doing for him. Sometimes we get so consumed with the, 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 the manner, the, the kind of, uh, the programs uh, that we follow and the, the how-tos of how to serve. Uh, but, you know, God is concerned about the motives of our service, why we do what we do. So in your service, make sure that you're seeking to serve God. Remember this title, servant, a servant of who? A servant of the Lord. And that's what you want to do when you serve the Lord, whatever it may be. Make sure that you're doing it as unto the Lord. If you love the Lord, now's the time when you should be getting excited because it's nearly your turn. It's nearly time where you're able to once again pick up the trowel, as it were, and to get busy in serving the Lord. So serve God. Whatever you do, whatever, whatever field you may be serving, make sure that you're doing it as unto God. In the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, we read, 
that we're to serve, not with eye service, with men as men please, pleases, but as the servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart, with goodwill doing service as to the Lord and not to men. So the first thing as you get ready to serve is to serve God. He's the one that you want to be serving. Then secondly, you want to be serving others. And as you go through the Bible, you'll come across multiple examples of men and women who served others, who served the Lord by serving others. Now, I just want to draw one, ten, one woman to your attention, uh, a woman by the name of Phoebe. And we read of her in Romans chapter 6 and the first couple of verses where Paul says, I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is the servant of the church which is at Centuria, that you receive her in the Lord as become a saints, and that ye assist her in whatsoever business she have need of you. Notice it says, for she hath been a succor of many and of myself also. She was someone that greatly helped the work of God by helping the saints of God. Paul says, she's been a blessing to me. She's helped me. And he says, she's been a sacra of many. She's been a great help. Now that word sacra is, is a great word. It's, it's actually used of our Lord as well. He's able to succor us. And it means to run to the aid of, run to the help of. And we have here Phoebe, someone who lit, literally ran to the aid of someone else. So she was the kind of person that if you needed help, then you could rely on her come running to help you. So we need to make sure that we're serving others. In 2 Corinthians 4, Paul said, We preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. And then he said, And ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. So serve the Lord and serve others. Thirdly, I want you to see that in our service, we want to serve joyfully. I'd like you to take your Bibles and go to Luke chapter 10. It's a well-known passage as we read about uh, these two sisters, Mary and Martha. They, of course, were the sisters of, of Lazarus. But Luke chapter 10, verse 38, and we'll read to verse 42. And it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. But one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Now when we read these verses, we normally think of it that this is a lesson between sitting and serving. Worshipping or working. And we kind of contrast it with this. And of course, Jesus was saying that it was, you know, Mary had chosen the, the better part and that she was, you know, just sitting at the feet of Jesus and, and listening to him and worship him. And Martha, you can just imagine, she was just coming about all this serving and she was just, just working. She wasn't taking the time to just wait on the Lord. It is a great Lord, a great lesson for us to learn in that. But um, I don't want to speak to you necessarily about the difference between sitting at the feet of Jesus in one person and another person being busy in service, like Martha. I, I want you to think about Martha. There was something wrong with Martha. There was something wrong. It wasn't just that she wasn't sitting at the feet of Jesus there and then. There was something wrong with her service. She was busy. But in her busyness, she had no joy. And, and Jesus, uh, the Bible speaks about this word. Jesus used the, 
the word she was she was troubled and she was troubled and she was full of care. Uh, and then before that, we read that she was cumbered. That word cumbered is an interesting word because it, it means the word cumber means to hamper or to hinder. It has the idea of dragging something about along with you. You cumbering along with something. I don't know if I've just invented a new English word there, but you, the word cumber means to hinder or to uh, hamper, but it means to be a drag. And this is what had happened with Martha. Service got to be a drag. There was no joy. She didn't serve out of a heart of love. It was out of a heart, or rather of a mind, saying, well, somebody's got to do this. And so her joy, her service was one of duty, but no joy. And the best service that we have for our God is always going to stem from the worship that we have with our God. So sometimes people say, what should I do? Should I serve or should I be sitting at the feet of Jesus? Or both. You need to be, but you need to start here. You need to be starting in your worship. And from your worship, there will be a, a joyful working for the Lord. But worship is always going to precede that of working. So in your service, serve the Lord with gladness. If your service has become a hindrance, if it's hampering you in your spiritual life, if it's a drag, there's something wrong with your service. Because God wants you to serve Him joyfully. Maybe the time is to then just sit at the feet of Jesus and learn to worship and learn from Him so that you could be best prepared to serve. So serve joyfully. And then fourthly, you want to serve faithfully. You know, when I, just to take your mind back to 1 Chronicles chapter 6, when you read that list of names and there was a turn given to them as to when it was their time to serve, you can mark this down. When it was their time to serve, they would have served faithfully. There was a waiting with anticipation for when it was their next opportunity to go into the tabernacle or perhaps uh, bear the trumpet or, or lead the congregation in singing. And you can well imagine that when they did it, they did it faithfully. So whatever we do, we want to do faithfully. It doesn't matter if we're picking up a paper or lifting up a sinner. We want to do what we do in a, with a faithful heart. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he said, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. And he's saying that we just continue on uh, faithfully. If you look at the word of God and you come across all those men and women that are recorded for us, you can see that they were people that were faithful from the smaller things to the larger things, to uh, people that perhaps weren't as important as man might reckon to ministering to the Apostle Paul. They were just faithful in all that they did. When I think about the word faithful, I think you're somebody that can be relied upon. Get ready to serve. It's never your turn. And in your service, be faithful. And then firstly, I want you to remember you need to serve the Lord patiently. Again, in the book of Revelation, and we have the message to the seven churches there. Well, in, to, the, to the church at Ephesus and to the church of Thyatira, this is what we read in the uh, Chapter 2, verse 3, to the church of Ephesus, Thou hast borne and hast patience, and for my sake, for my name's sake, hath laboured and hast not fainted. Notice that they had patience in their service and in their labour. And the church of Thyatira, verse 19, I know thy works and charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works. Service for the Lord is always going to require patience on our part. Because the fact of the matter is, you might serve the Lord in, in some corner of his vineyard, and it may be a long time before you see 
any fruit from what you've sown. In fact, if you read any uh, biographies of great men and women, missionaries have gone to the field. Sometimes they've gone years and years. Some of them have returned from the field and not seen the fruit of their labor, but they just continued on faithfully and patiently. And we need to be faithful, whether we're sowing, and then we water what we've sown. We may have, may have the joy of reaping, but another may come behind us and they may have, have the joy of reaping what we have sown and what we watered. But it doesn't matter, we're doing it for the Lord. And so as long as he gets the glory, that's the most important thing. And we want to just continue on patiently, patiently serving the Lord. And then the last one is uh, we need to serve the Lord expectantly. And this kind of goes with what we looked at with patience. In your service for God, do something. But as you do something, expect God to work and expect God to move. This has to do with all of our labors. We need to do it with a heart full of faith, expecting God to do something, knowing that it's not of our own strength, it's all of God and looking to him to uh, give to us a, a great blessing from what we do. And as we look expectantly, we could look at it in two different ways. We can say, well, we're expecting God to work now. So whether it be in the matter of uh, building that Sunday school class or the youth group or seeing that person saved or seeing that person get victory in their life. Uh, we need to do it expectantly that God is going to work and God is going to move. And so we're patient on one hand, but on the other hand, we're expecting that God is going to do a great work. And God will do a great work. Let's just continue serving, uh, realizing that he will. But also, uh, a couple with this idea of expectancy is that we know that as we read the word of God, intertwined in our service with God, God always uh, gives to us the promise of a reward. And so as you serve, you can also, you know, kind of lift your heart to heaven with realizing that what you do today, what you do down here is going to count for eternity. And so coupled together with your faithful service is always this idea that God is going to reward his faithful servant. He will get the glory. It's all done for our good. And so there's a great reward in that. But as we serve, we want to serve the Lord expectantly. I love that verse in Hebrews chapter 12, where the Bible says in verse 28, Wherefore we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably and reverently. Um, serve God acceptably with reverence and with godly fear. So we want to make sure that we're serving the Lord expectantly so it's nearly your turn it's nearly your turn the lockdown will lift soon we'll get back to normal soon we'll get back to ministry it's nearly your turn maybe looking forward to that time where once again you can serve the lord in a more freer and open way we are somewhat hindered and hampered in how we serve today but let's use this time let's use this hour to ready ourselves for service. It's nearly your turn. And as you get ready to serve, make sure that you're serving God and others and serving joyfully and serving faithfully and patiently and expectantly. It's nearly your turn to serve. The lockdown will be lifted. We'll get back to a time where we can serve once again. And may the Lord help us during these hours that we would prepare our hearts and prepare our minds and ready ourselves to get busy in serving our Lord. It's nearly time to get busy once again. So may the Lord bless you. And I do not say this to say that we do nothing now. Do what you can. But uh, obviously we are somewhat hindered. But as we uh, look forward down the path, we can see that there's going to come a time where we can get busy in serving the Lord once again. So when you read through those lists of names and chronicles and elsewhere, realize that they're there for a reason. If your name was there, you'd perhaps read it differently. And these people were looking forward to a time when they could 
serve the Lord. And may we be seeking to be ridding ourselves to serve the Lord as well. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. And may the Lord help in you, help in you and strengthen you by his grace. Let's pray. We are thankful, Lord, for your word and the encouragement that we have from it. And we do pray now that you'd have your hand upon us, Lord. We pray, Lord, you'd help us to serve you aright. As we seek to worship you, we want to worship in spirit and in truth. And Lord, our service needs to come from that worship, whereby we will serve you with a true heart and seek to do your will and do it in your way. So help us, Lord, we pray, that we would ready ourselves, prepare ourselves, so that we can best serve you for your glory and for your honour and for our good. We'll thank you and praise you in the precious name of Jesus, our Saviour. Amen. Well, the Lord bless you. I trust that you have uh, a blessed uh, Lord's Day and uh, look forward to seeing you again uh, in the weeks to come. God bless. Goodbye.